the beginning of chapter two of part one of Don Quixote, we witness the protagonist escaping from his own house. The narrator uses symbolic puns and comic touches. He mounted Rocinante, straightened his misshapen helmet, braced his leather shield, grabbed his lance, and through the back door of a corral, he rode out into the countryside. Then we learn of Don Quixote's first problem, one that made him hesitate regarding the entire enterprise. Technically speaking, according to the law of chivalry, Don Quixote has not yet been knighted. No matter, his plan is to get himself knighted by the first one he came across. But until then, it will be necessary to carry blank white arms. In other words, no image or device on his shield. Obviously, his grandfather's weapons are not so white because he observes that he has to clean them yet again, making them whiter than an ermine. The ermine is a symbol of purity. Does Cervantes have in mind sexual, moral, or military purity? Maybe all of these. Meanwhile, thinking that his adventure should take place according to fate, Don Quixote lets Rocinante go wherever he wants. And now he begins to tell his own story. Notice again Cervantes' use of the direct interior style, which gives us access to the knight's thoughts. He proceeded talking to himself. In this way, the author introduces us to and reminds us of several important topics. First, he alludes to Greco-Roman myth, letting Don Quixote refer to Apollo, the sun god, and Aurora, the goddess of the dawn, the latter pursued by her jealous husband. Second, he presents for the first time the idea of a sage wizard who in future episodes, besides being the chronicler of Don Quixote's story, a typical recourse in the books of chivalry, will sometimes annoy and other times assist him. Third, he reveals Don Quixote's insatiable pride when the famous knight Don Quixote of La Mancha departing the slothful feathers mounted his famous steed. Fourth, he reminds us of Rocinante, his faithful companion, and Dulcinea, his mistress and motivation. And fifth, he highlights the ridiculous language Don Quixote prefers to deploy, especially the use of the medieval F instead of the modern H, fecho instead of hecho, afincamiento instead of aincamiento, and fermosura instead of hermosura. Cervantes will maintain this playfully antiquated language throughout the novel, as other characters and even the narrator himself will adopt it in key moments with great comic effect. The effect is impossible to translate. Finally, the narrator prepares us for the first adventure, reminding us of Don Quixote's unstable psychology, observing that the day was warm enough to melt his brains, if he had any. And right after this, we learn how the Hidalgo plans on becoming a knight. He longed to encounter straight away someone with whom to prove the valor of his mighty arm. In other words, he will win the title by force. Now Cervantes again emphasizes the uncertain authorship of what we are reading. It is a labyrinthical complication. It seems some authors claim that the first adventure occurred at Puerto Lapice, and others think it was the windmills episode. But the narrator reports that he has found in the annals of La Mancha that nothing at all happened that day. What annals are these? And more importantly, who is their author? We will not know for many chapters. All we know is that Don Quixote was looking for a castle or a hut in which to spend the night. But what he finds is more prosaic, an inn. This discovery is told in terms that are both biblical and epic, an inn. It was as if he had seen a star which guided him toward not the gates, but the citadels, Alcáceres, of his redemption. Notice that the castle from the Middle Ages associated with the kingdom of Castile has been transformed into Alcáceres, citadels in English, suggesting the Arabic south toward which the hero wanders in search of some redemption. Alcázar from the classical Arabic Alcázar meaning fortress. So southeast of Toledo, in the countryside of Montiel, both Don Quixote and his imagination head south towards the Arabic palaces of Andalusia. And of course this Andalusian fortress has its drawbridge and its deep moat. Unlike the mythological purity and transcendence we saw at the beginning of the chapter, Don Quixote is now confronted by the novel's first worldly characters, a pair of prostitutes who were on their way to Seville with some mule drivers. This is the first explicit reference to sexuality in a novel brimming with sexual allusions. Notice also the subtle and humorous development of Don Quixote's madness. The narrator informs us that he paused in the hopes that some dwarf would emerge from the battlements and blow a trumpet to signal the arrival of a knight. Then comes another laughable intervention by the narrator 
who makes fun of the puritanical expectations of some readers. Don Quixote gets the greeting he was hoping for by way of the horn of a swineherd who happens to arrive with a herd of pigs. Sorry, but that is what they are called. Approaching the prostitutes, Don Quixote again deploys his ridiculous language. Flee not, dear ladies, and fear no villainous act, for the order of chivalry that I profess does not tolerate or allow that I commit any such deed. And suddenly, the female characters break out in laughter. Don Quixote, a novel famous for its comedic humor, constantly asks us to consider what laughter means. In this case, we see that laughter can indicate or even cause social tension. Their laughter grew and so did his anger. Here, laughter seems to check our hero's ego. Next, we have an exchange between Don Quixote and the innkeeper, whom the knight errant thinks is the fortress master, alcaide in Spanish, but also the governor of the castle, castellano in Spanish. But the innkeeper is more properly a rogue, picaro in Spanish, already a classic figure in the literature of the period. In other words, he is an intermediate figure, somewhere between a thief and a beggar, perpetually involved in trickery. This is to a pun on the two possible meanings of castellano. First, in the medieval jargon constantly employed by Don Quixote, the term means governor of a castle. But the innkeeper himself receives the term as if the knight were calling him one of the good men of Castilla, which in common parlance was a euphemism for thief. Of course, the term could also be a national moniker referring to someone from the kingdom of Castile. For this reason, the narrator specifies that the Castilian, sorry, I mean the innkeeper, was Andalusian and one of those from the shore of San Lucar, northwest of Cadiz. References to geography are always important to Don Quixote. The first example of poetry in the novel establishes an identification between Don Quixote and Lanzarote, an Arthurian knight, legendary for his sexuality. Don Quixote quotes from a famous ballad of Lanzarote. Never was a knight by damsels so well served and then he tells the prostitutes that a time will come when the valor of this my arm will declare the desire I have for you. Castile and Andalusia are again contrasted, this time by way of the euphemistic term truchuela. The narrator informs us that this heavily salted fish was also called cod in Castile and ling in Andalusia. Don Quixote does not understand and believes that the women refer to the offspring of a mature trout, so the narrator formulates another joke, which also serves up another monetary illusion. Don Quixote accepts the plate, saying that as long as he has served a number of little trout, these can substitute for a trout. That is the same as paying me a dollar in small coins instead of a piece of eight. Then Cervantes has the prostitutes try to serve the hero a perverse Eucharist composed of black bread and wine, which Don Quixote cannot access because of his complicated helmet. Given the picaresque allusions in this episode, it is likely that the cane, a kind of straw that the women employ to give Don Quixote his wine, alludes to a famous episode in the life of Lazarillo de Tormes. The chapter comes to a close when a reed whistle is heard, this time blown not by a swineherd, but by a pig castrator. All of this is most irreverent. <laughs>